Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's live stream and our final live stream of the year. Uh, Brad Tallis, my buddy, is on the keyboard. Um, let me know if you guys, uh, if this is working. Let me see. Let me make sure. One moment. Let me just make sure it's working. All right, looks like it's working and it's live. Can you guys hear me okay? Drop in the comments. Uh, I had a little glitch on that screen and it paused for a moment. So yeah, looks like all is well. Uh, let's see. All right, cool. Thanks, Stuart, for letting me know. Uh, these are live. These are uh, sometimes they, they go well and sometimes technology bites us. So like I said, welcome to today's live stream. Let me, all right, thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Okay, so a couple of announcements. Uh, so this will be our last live stream of the year. We appreciate all of you for coming every Thursday and watching these. Brad does a, a lot of them, and uh, I do them from time to time. And what we hope to do is to continue that next year and do them every Thursday. We'll flip-flop back and forth between Mr. Brad Tallis and I. So a uh, couple of announcements. Let me see. I wrote them down. So we're off for the next few weeks uh, for the holiday. Uh, so Autodesk will be shut down, so we won't be doing any live streams for the next two weeks. Our next live stream will be Brad on January 7th, so the 7th of January. He'll be doing a series called How Would You Make That? Encourage you to check it out. He showed me uh, what uh, he's going to be covering. It will be customers. Uh, he had a few customers ask, ask him questions, so he's going to showcase and show how he does that. So today what we're going to be covering is all the... Um, Toolpaths under the 2D menu. Uh, we've done the series under the uh, setup, covered those, and we've, we're just going to take it to the next next level. So let me switch screens, make sure everything is good to go on my end. And uh, if you remember, so let me pull up the, the part I want to start with. So we've been doing the, the setup um, series with this. And what we're going to cover today, guys, is uh, these toolpaths, 2D Adaptive, 2D Pocket, Face, Contour, un and all of these listed. Uh, so I've got examples of all of those. If you have any questions, uh, type them in the chat. I'm going to try not to read those and get distracted by those. Uh, Brad will be monitoring those, and then he'll send me a, a message to answer any questions. So I'll pause from time to time to address those. Uh, also want to uh, tell my buddy Morgan, he, uh, he suggested I cover cutter compensation today. So I'll make sure that I talk about cutter compensation. All right, so diving right in, uh, under the 2D toolpaths, the very first one, we have 2D adaptive clearing. And uh, it has that tooltip. Tells you what it does. That's a beautiful thing about Fusion. It gives you a nice tooltip. If you're ever not sure what it does, just pause for a moment with your mouse, and it will give you that tooltip. Uh, so these two, these two are very similar, uh, with slightly different behavior. So uh, if I wanted to do a 2D adaptive uh, to just rough out a pocket or rough out an area, so if I just wanted to machine out this area here, say this slot. So this is a pretty good size part. Um, this tool here is half an inch diameter, which is 12.7 millimeters. So it gives you an idea of the scale and size of this part. So we've got these guys here. Um, generally, when you open it up, it looks like this, and you can't see what it says. If you hover your mouse, it says tool geometry. But what I like to do is click on that handle there and drag it a little bit wider. Uh, now, sometimes what you'll get, guys, is I get this, people open it, and then they click here, and they undock this window. And, and then when you get to the Passes tab, or depending on the operation, this vertical portion is very, uh, very big with a lot of options. And then the OK and Cancel are like down off your screen, and then you have to uh, move things around or maybe go to a shorter uh, toolpath, uh, not toolpath, shorter window, so that it exposes that. So what I encourage you guys all to do is just keep this guy docked. So you grab it, you move it over to the right until you see a green vertical line, let it go, now it's docked. And I can also tell it's docked by these two arrows there. All right, so now I'll bring this out wider. 
That's uh, one of my tips. Okay, so very first thing uh, we want to do in Fusion is pick a tool. It remembers the last tool I used, which is that half inch diameter end mill. Under geometry, I need to tell it what I'm machining. So I'll zoom in on this area, and what I want to do is just grab this here, and as I hover over, you'll see that it highlights a little bit. So if I grab that edge, look what happens. And so it gives me that uh, dark line, which is the contoured edge, and then this blue highlighted area, that's, that's a preview of what Fusion sees as a material. And that preview is, it's using the stock that we've defined in our setup. So our stock is that rectangular stock. So it's picking that up, Fusion knows that. Um, other things here, instead of picking that edge, what happens if I click on that face? You get slightly different behavior. So be mindful of that, guys, if you're picking an edge or a face. So that blue preview area, that blue highlight, is what Fusion sees as material to remove. And I like that selection. I'm just going to go ahead and hit OK and see what Fusion gives me. And you can see here now we've got a toolpath there. And the red uh, arrow there, that's what's going to enter. It's going to wrap it down in yellow. The green is where, where it's going to start feeding in. It arcs in, and then it's going to start machining the part. And that step over there between each line, uh, that is controlled on the Passes tab. So all I did was select the 2D Adaptive. So I'll right-click, I'll mouse, uh, right mouse click, I'll edit that guy. So all we did, the only selection we did was we verified our tool is correct, and we clicked that pocket selection. I didn't hit the heights by default. The bottom height, where the tool goes in the Z-axis, or Z, um, it goes to the contour you selected. So I always be, I'm, almost, I'm always mindful of the geometry that I select on my part. So I know that I don't need to go down and select it. So I could have grabbed the top edge here and maybe chamfered that, uh, not chamfered that, grab the top edge and it would select that. And then depending on the geometry, it might wrap around and try to do the whole part. So you, you do get different behavior based on what you select. I'm going to leave all of these as default. I'm going to come over to the Passes tab. Now, Passes tab is what happens when the tool is in the cut, in the material. Uh, I'm going to leave that at 0.1 millimeters on the tolerance. Optimal load, if I hover my, my mouse over it, this is the engagement of the side of the tool into the material. So adaptive is a constant engagement strategy where it's always a taking the same amount of load. You can see in that image on the bottom where it says no HSM or high-speed machining. When the tool enters a, into a corner, it has full load. If you're doing the adaptive or high-speed machining strategy, it has a constant load. So the tool is always removing the same amount of material. If I right mouse click, I'll come here to Edit Expression. These are built in, uh, built into Fusion. And out of the box, it comes with some suggestions. Uh, right now, it's 40% of my tool diameter. So the tool will step over 40% of my tool. I can change that from 40% to 20%. Now I can hit OK. And now you can see that value has changed. If I right mouse click, you can save that. I'm going to say make default. So now moving forward, anytime I use a 2D adaptive strategy, the step over amount will be 20% of my tool diameter. So now if I hit OK, you'll see we have more step over passes there. And that distance from there to there is 20% of my tool diameter. I like doing a percentage of my tool diameter instead of a numerical value because if I go ahead and change my tool from a 12.7 millimeter diameter tool or half inch end mill to a, say, um, six millimeter end mill or a quarter inch end mill, then I don't need to go back and remember. I know that the step over will always be 20%. So that's a good strategy. A couple other things I want to talk about here. See those yellow lines? That's where it's wrapping. So let's just do a quick uh, simulation here. I'm going to grab that whole operation, hit simulate. And now I'm going to hit play. It's going to rough everything, but I'm going to expand that just so you can see all the other operations that we've covered in previous live streams. I can fast forward it, like scrub down here on the bottom, 
other things you can do, you can hit pause there, and then with your mouse, you left mouse click, and you could scrub through that way. Uh, but what I want to do, I want to go straight to this adaptive strategy. So in the background, what's going to happen, it's going to remove all that material. And that's a pretty big part. So it's doing some work to remove all of that. And I'll let that catch up. And then now when I hit play, it will play that uh, 2D adaptive toolpath. But again, it's uh, in the background trying to catch up and go through all of these operations. So now watch me hit pause. Remember how I said you can scrub through? You could do that. And every time I do that, Fusion has to go back and recalculate. So let me just hit play. Let that catch up again. I won't scrub backwards. We don't want that to, to have to go ahead and recalculate every time. We've got some functionality uh, to capture all of that. Uh, we'll talk about that in another live stream. So again, waiting for that to catch up. I should have done this on a smaller part, so it wouldn't uh, require so much uh, generation of that toolpath, but all good, all good. So now you see how it's lifting up and retracting, and then it's, now it's cutting, then it lifts up and retracts. You can control that. How do you control that? So I'm gonna close. Under the 2D adaptive, right mouse click, left mouse click, sorry, right mouse click, edit. Go to, um, so we talked about passes, that's everything that takes place in the cut. Another thing I like to do is smoothing. Turn that guy on. Uh, what smoothing does, I'll, I'll get to the link in one moment. What smoothing does is it will create an arc move that fits within that tolerance band. So that image on the left where it says smoothing off, it's kind of hard to see, but on your own screen when you view this, uh, it has the dark green line with some black dots. Each black dot is a straight line move. So it's straight line, straight line, straight line, a bunch of straight lines, a bunch of small straight lines can create an arc. So what you can get sometime at your machine is data starvation or stuttering, and you can see that in the surface finish. If you turn smoothing on, smoothing will uh, generate an arc within that tolerance band. So I encourage you to turn that on. Uh, it does increase the calculation time uh, depending on the size of your uh, model and file and toolpath. I'll leave that off for now just to increase uh, speed. And then linking, remember I was just talking about those retract moves. That is controlled here, maximum stay down distance. So right now that value is 63.5. If I put something like 2,000 millimeters or about 80 inches, watch what will happen now. When I hit generate, remember how before those moves, it was lifting up and retracting because the distance from here to here was greater than 63 millimeters, uh, I changed it to 2,000 millimeters. So when it gets to the end of the cut here and it needs to go back to the beginning, it says if there's any move less than 2,000 millimeters, stay down. And that's what it's doing. Okay? Don't want to spend too much time on this because we have a lot of other tool paths to go. Again, if you have any questions, let Mr. Brad Tallis know and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, next toolpath. Under the 2D, we did 2D adaptive clearing. We'll do a 2D pocket. Very similar. Uh, all these menus are the same. And again, I'll use that same tool. Under geometry, you can go to pocket selection. And I can work on this same pocket. I think I'll just do that so you can see the behavior of the toolpath and uh, like a head-to-head -head comparison. And again, these pocketing uh, an adaptive you can use on a fully closed pocket, but I'm just doing it out here just so you can see the difference in the behavior. So if I click on that edge, again, we get that whole area there. Now, what I did last time, remember I did this, I clicked on that face and I get a different uh, selection. Watch this, what if I do click on that edge and Fusion is seeing that whole stock that we've defined in our setup. And remember our stock that we've defined is a big rectangular piece of material. So it's projecting that out and it's seeing that. If you ever get this behavior, you can control that by hitting this stock contours. So if you toggle that on, again, we get that yellow rectangle. That is the stock that we've defined in our setup up here in the previous live stream. <clears throat> and then you can control that. You can say, 
keep my tool and let me just click on that face and it'll say keep my tool within this yellow boundary and that's where my material is now when I hit OK I'll get a tool path and it's very similar to the previous except it does it what it does it takes this contoured edge and it offsets it whatever that step over amount is and it sees where the material is it knows it's an open edge there and then I can simulate this guy. And to save time, I'm just going to turn off stock. So I'm just going to hit play. And you can view that. So very similar to the first one, except it what it does, it offsets that edge. And it's a, just a continuous offset of that final edge there. OK? So that is 2D, 2D pocket. Take a quick look at the chat. If there's any questions, I will let Brad ping me. Again, to save some time, I'm going to keep going. Next, we've got face. What are we doing with face operation? So I'll click that. I'm going to pick a tool. I don't want to face that big part with a half inch end mill or a 12.7 millimeter end mill. So I'm going to come in here and hit select. And if I go to uh, one of my previous uh, setups that I used, I'm going to grab this tool here, a face mill. I'm going to do select. And again, I'm going to allow Fusion to do all the work for me. I just select the facing operation, select my tool. I'm not going to address anything else here. I'm just going to show you what happens if I hit OK. We'll get a tool path. And again, it utilizes the stock that we did in our setup. And remember, it was that big rectangle. And I can show you what it sees if I go into here. Under geometry, you see that yellow rectangle? That's what Fusion sees as material. But if for some reason I don't want it to do that and I don't want it cutting there, let's say that material is not there. Again, this follows what you define in your setup, but I do have control over that. Under stock selection, I can click, let's grab that whole profile of the part, and I'll grab that. And now look what happens. Now Fusion will just face that area. So if I simulate and I hit play, it's just going to hit the area that is contained in that area that I clicked, the basic silhouette of that part. OK. You have some control in the facing operation, right mouse click, edit. So under geometry, we just talked about tool orientation. That is if you wanted to work on another face. I'll talk about that under contour. Under heights, uh, again, you can change any of these. But I do want to mill to the model top. And I want to start from the stock top. Under passes, I can add multiple depths. So I can say, take a half a millimeter. Uh, per pass and then do one finishing at uh, 0.1 millimeters and use even step downs also up here I'll, I'll you'll when I click OK you'll see what happens there under pass direction it says zero degrees zero degrees uh, is in the orientation of your X how you've defined X in your setup so if I want to mill at say 90 degrees to that now I'll hit OK and remember that it was going this way. Now it's going 90 degrees to my X. You see that red arrow? So it's 90 degrees is perpendicular to that. I could even make it 45 or give it an angle, whatever I want. 45 degrees. And again, it's doing those multiple passes in Z, multiple step downs. And you can see as I zoom in, it's doing those roughing passes and then that final pass. And then if we look at the linking, um, you've got some checkboxes here, uh, smooth, you know, on the, uh, when it does a transition. Uh, by default, it's set to smooth. I like that one. We'll hit OK. All right. Moving steadily along. I know Brad and I, we tend to go over. Uh, we, we tend to go over on our live streams. And uh, I want to be mindful of everybody's time and make sure that we do our best to stay um, to completion at the top of the hour and also leave some time at the end to handle any 
questions. So again, like I said, if you have any questions, please let Mr. Brad know and he'll let me know as well. Okay, coming back to this. So we covered 2D Adaptive, 2D Pocket, Face, 2D Contour. I'm gonna stick with the same part. So if I wanna do a 2D Contour, what does that do? We've got some options. So first thing, I'm gonna select a tool. I don't wanna use that face mill. I will use this tool, this three-quarter tool. It's about 19 millimeters for the international audience. All right, so I've selected my tool. I'm not gonna worry about speeds and feeds. Under contour selection, this is where you grab an edge that you wanna mill. So you could grab this bottom edge and it will machine the whole part. You also have some control. So what if uh, I don't wanna do the whole thing? What if I just wanna do this edge? And then this edge, you can do it that way. Also, to take your selections further, you could just hit one of these lines. So if I grab this, watch what happens. If I grab that, it's gonna wanna grab everything. Pro tip, listen to this pro tip. So I'm on a Mac and I'm gonna hold my Alt, uh, sorry, my Option button. It's Alt on a Windows or on a PC. So on my Mac, I'm gonna hold the Option button and I'm just gonna click this. What that does, it's in single entity selection mode. So just grab that one line and it will now just mill that one part. Also wanna be mindful of the behavior of it. So what? let me just hit okay and you'll see what I mean. So it's just gonna mill that line right there and it's gonna keep the tool to the left-hand side of it in the direction it's going. Now that's really not milling anything. What I wanted to do is for the tool to come down to this edge. So let me right mouse click, edit. And under geometry, I grab that edge, but what I should have done to save time is grab the bottom edge. And now when I look at the heights tab for my bottom height, the depth that the tool will go, it's taking that from the selected contour that I selected. So now I can say from the contour I selected, go another half a millimeter below that. And now look what happens. Now the tool will be, let me fit that big part. So now the bottom of the tool will go half a millimeter below that, about 20 thousandths. Okay. Now I've got a corner radius there of my tool. I need to be mindful of that. I can nerd out and say minus corner radius on that uh, offset but I just wanted to highlight the behavior and to pay attention on what you're clicking because uh, it saves you some mouse clicks. So I could have done this under my geometry. If I were to grab this, say, top edge here, this guy here, and what if I wanted to go mill down to this edge? Um, if I click that, it will give me, look at that, I have two red arrows. It says I have two chains. But what I want, I just want to do that in one chain. So I'm going to exit that out. Again, I'm going to hold Option on my Mac. It's Alt on your Windows. I'm going to click this. Another pro tip, you click this again. So you click it once to get that dark blue line. Click it again to get this to pop up. And this is the contour selection dialog. And you can do a closed contour or open contour. And you can see that's highlighted in blue because I just selected that one line so it knows it's gonna be an open contour. Now when I'm here, I say, I just wanna mill to this line. So I wanna grab those two light blue lines. It's kinda of hard to see, but I can see them clearly. And then I wanna make sure, always make sure, pro tip, make sure you accept that contour. Because if you don't accept that and you do something else, I will lose my selection. So I'm going to accept that now. Now I've got that dark blue line. And this red arrow there, if I look at it from the top, whoops, sorry, my mouse wheel. Okay, dark blue line is what we're cutting. 
Red arrow shows the direction and the side of the cut, so that serves three purposes. If I click on this arrow, it will flip the side, so then my tool will be on the uh, left-hand side in the direction it's cutting. But I want the tool to be out here. And again, on the heights, we've got some options. I don't want to go to my selected contour. In this case, I want to go to the model bottom, the bottom of the model, and go another half a millimeter below. Now I've got that corner radius. I'm just going to say minus one there, one millimeter, and hit OK. Now my tool will be one millimeter below the model bottom, and it just contour these two edges. Okay, a couple other tips that we have available to us in Contour. There's a lot you can do. I can give it uh, an, an extension distance here. If I say, give me 25 millimeters tangentially from the beginning and end. And now look what happens. Now it extended that 25 millimeters that way, 25 millimeters that way. I could right mouse click under here, give it a separate tangential extension distance. And I can say exit at 100 millimeters. And now I've got 25 millimeter on the entry, 100 on the exit. So you have a lot of control. You can also give it a negative value. If for some reason you wanted to shorten your tool path up, again, depending on what you're doing, I sometimes use this on tabbing parts. Um, let's say minus 10. So I'll give it a minus value on both. So now if I look at it from the top, it's a minus value there and it's a minus value there. One other thing on this, under geometry, I'm just gonna clear these uh, tangential extension distance. And if I tell it stock contours, if I turn that on, that yellow rectangle popped up and now watch what happens it automatically extended the toolpath to the contour edges of the stock. So again, right mouse click, edit this guy under geometry. It projected that line out all the way to here on the beginning and all the way here on the end. And that ha happens automatically because I selected stock contours. Now I have this, if I wanted to constrain it to something, I could select that instead of that rectangle. A whole lot of control. Next, um, my buddy Morgan suggested cutter compensation. Let me talk about that quickly here. So what if I wanted to mill this bore here and that bore, uh, it's a precision uh, bore and I wanted to control that with uh, cutter compensation to apply an offset at my machine. So if I have a bore and I'm milling that bore with my cutting tool and I measure it and it's slightly undersized, when, when you use cutter compensation, you could then tell it to open up that bore by a certain amount, a quarter millimeter, a few tenths, whatever, by giving it a plus or minus at your machine. So you don't have to repost any code. I'll show you how to do that in Fusion. So if I want to grab this edge, I want to mill that. So I clicked on that edge and under passes. So here we've got our sideways compensation. We briefly talked about that with that red arrow and then compensation type. By default, it's in computer. In computer is what we're looking at right now on the screen. You can do in control or where. I recommend where. So. If you do in control, it will give you the G code at your machine of the coordinates of the arc in this case. And then in your control, you would have to tell the machine the diameter of your tool. That's fine, that works. Uh, but if you use where, like I have here, it will give me the code uh, to the center of the tool, tool uh, like this arrow there. And uh, when I hit okay, You'll see that a little bit better. There are some rules in cutter comp that we need to obey. But basically what I was saying is when you're looking at it here, the coordinates that it gives you on your G code will give you the coordinates for this blue line, the center of your tool. And that's a preferred method because there are some uh, rules in cutter compensation that we need to obey. 
Rule number one, you cannot engage or turn on cutter compensation on an arc move. So on my linking, I'm going to take this vertical lead-in radius out. Uh, we've got a horizontal lead-in radius. We have a lead-in sweep angle. That's fine. And we've got the linear lead-in distance. So that straight line move, you can see that red arrow. That straight line move, when you in initiate cutter compensation, must be greater than the compensation amount. So if I have a value here of 0.1, and I generate my code. It's hard to tell, but we've got a straight line move uh, from here to here. And actually, let me come in here and change one more thing. This perpendicular, uh, hold on, where are we at here? Lead in is vertical. Okay, so let's leave this guy. I'm just going to leave that like that, actually. Yeah. So that, that first move, that lead in move, must be uh, greater than your compensation amount, or you'll get an error at your machine. Um, I'm going to keep on moving along here. We'll touch more on that later. Okay. Let me think about what else I wanted to show on this part. We did 2D contour. Ah, okay. Next one after 2D contour, we have slot. So that, I created a sample part here that looks like this. And I did want to show you one other thing on the uh, 2D contour, how to use uh, tool orientation. So if I'm doing a 2D contour, and let me just grab... Uh, let's say the bottom edge of this part. My tool will mill around that. But what if I want to stand my part up in a vise like this and machine this edge? How do you handle that? What you want to do, again, so our setup was like this. You see our z-axis pointing up. But what if I want to stand it up on that way? And let's say this is a multi-axis machine and I want it to hit that in the same setup. Uh, very first thing I would do is set my tool orientation and select my Z normal. And now you'll see that my Z is now pointing up. Instead of grabbing a face, like I grab that face, you have the ability to grab a line. And again, it'll go in the direction of that line. You can even grab, not that you would. Uh, do I have a fillet there? Yeah, I'm not going to grab that. I thought that might have been if that was a chamfer. Uh, but so now my Z is pointing that orientation. Now under geometry, what do I want to mill? I want to mill this line. And again, our tool is to the left-hand side. If I click that arrow, it'll change the side and direction, okay? Now, how deep do I want to go? Remember I talked about be mindful of what you're selecting? I want to just grab this bottom line. I want to work smarter, not harder. So I'll go to my Heights tab, and from the contour I selected, go down minus uh, a quarter inch. Verify what tool I have. Ah, I don't want to do that with the chamfer mill. Let me pick this tool instead. All right, so that looks better. And I'm just going to hit OK. And now we've milled that side. So same contouring up. We can do uh, like we did here. You can mill any of these lines or pockets or edges. And then here we've got this part, and I've just showed you how to do that. We've got an error here. If you click on that, it'll tell you uh, what's going on. So it says Z-axis change. So generally, you can come in here and get some make heads and tails about it. I already have this operation earlier in that part. It's actually uh, right there. So I'm going to delete that guy. OK, next, continuing on with our 2D menu. Let me look and see if Brad sent me anything. Ah, okay. Let's see. From Stuart Duncan, when using stock from preceding setup and continue rest machining, the toolpath still sees the already removed stock and it is not possible to select a stock corner for the setup. I'm drawing a little blank on that. Let me read that one more time. When using stock from preceding setup, Okay, from a previous setup and continue rest machining, the toolpath still sees the already 
remove stock and it's not possible to select the stock corner for the setup. Yeah, if you're doing uh, from a previous op or previous setup, it takes that into account. I'm going to think about that question and carry on. Okay, slot. So, um, I've got these slots here. So I got a full slot here, I got a curved slot, and then I have this open slot. A couple ways to handle this. So if I come into here and then I do slot, again, I'm going to pick the tool I want to use. If I remember correctly, that was a half inch width slot, which is 12.7 millimeters. Grab that tool under geometry. It says pocket selection. I'm going to grab that bottom. And Fusion shows me a preview of that. I can grab this one now too. I'm going to leave this open one for separate. And then now on my heights, remember, we have this selected contour. Uh, the bottom height is coming from what you, the user, selected. I'm going to say minus quarter inch and hit OK. Let's see what we get. So that by default, we get this behavior. Let's talk about what we're seeing. So tool's going to enter here on the red arrow, and it's going to zigzag down and then cut. But we've already cleared all that material out in an earlier roughing strategy. So how do you control those heights and that entry? Right mouse click, edit, under the heights. So we talked about the bottom height. It's going to go to the bottom edge that I selected. I could even do this, go to model bottom, same behavior I'll get. Top height, instead of coming from the top of the stock that was defined in my setup, I can come here and I can do a selection. And I could say from this face, whoops, let me just grab that edge there, okay? So from that sketch point, if I look at it from here, that lighter blue line, it says now start milling from there. And now look what happens when I hit OK. So now it's not starting above the stock, it's starting above that face that I selected. What is that value? Here under heights, it's starting here 0.2 inches above the top height. See that says top height there? So I can change that so it's a little closer, maybe. 0 0.02 inches, about half a millimeter. Passes here. You have some options here. If you hover, like I said earlier, you get some information. And pay attention to these because they're really helpful. Okay? You can give it multiple depths, but I'm not even doing that because on my linking, it's just ramping down at 2 degrees. I can change that to one degree. And then the ramp clearance height, be mindful of this because sometimes if you have this value um, and it clashes with some of your heights, you'll get a, a yellow warning uh, on your toolpath. Let's change that to 0 0.01, about 10 thousandths. Okay, about quarter millimeter. I'm gonna hit okay. Now let's look at our behavior. And now it's starting a lot closer to the top when it zigzags down. Let me play that, and you'll see what we get. So now you'll see the tool zigzagging down into the slot. So the center of the tool will follow the center of the slot. If I had a smaller tool defined, it will still follow just the center of that slot. If you have something like that, you can use a 2D contour to hit this slot, even with cutter compensation to open up that slot if you need to. Now, what do you do if you have a slot like this that's open? You could come in here and say 2D contour and click on that edge, but then I get it wrapping around the whole thing. What did I say earlier? Hold Option on a Mac, Alt on a Windows, click on that edge, click it again, leave it as an open contour and rotate around. So I come over here, and it's kind of hard to tell, but it's light blue line, black line there, and I'm going to accept that. 
2D contour, you get that warning because it's a half inch tool trying to go into a half inch slot. I would then select a smaller tool and I can contour that. But let me delete that and I'm going to show you what you can do. You can use the 2D slot and under geometry, again, remember when, when you click this, it grabs everything, but just hold the option key on your Mac and or Alt on your Windows, click that again, you get into that open contour mode, come to here and accept that. Now, see that blue preview? That's the stock that Fusion sees. And what happens when I hit OK? It will now mill that slot at the depth I told it, which I forgot to tell it to go below. That's handled here on the height. So I can say minus 0 0.05 inches. OK, I didn't do any multiple step downs. If I wanted to, I can handle that here under the passes, multiple depths. I can say uh, 0.1 and OK. And again, it's coming from the stock top instead of that selection. Right mouse click, come over here under heights. Instead of coming from the stock top, do from a selection. And I can grab that point or even that face. And now it will start those step downs from this edge. All right. OK, so that is slot. Let's see what we have next. Under 2D, we covered all of these. Coming to trace, you'll see what it says there. Machines along contours with varying Z values, with or without left and right side comp. OK, one use for trace. What if I wanted to chamfer this edge along this swooping surface? How would I handle that? And it's not even a modeled chamfer. I can come into here and say trace. Let me grab a tool. Let's see, what do I have? Is that the tool? It's loading. Yep, sure, that tool will work for me. I will hit select that tool. Under geometry, I'm going to grab this top. And as I hover my mouse, you'll see it get black and then I'll click it. Selected that whole area. I'm good on the heights. I'm going to leave it as is. Under passes, because I've selected a chamfer mill, it automatically checked this checkbox to apply a chamfer. So I'm going to give it a chamfer width of something small, 0.01 inches. It's about a quarter millimeter. And then tip offset. What is that? That's how far the tip of the tool goes below that blue line or the contour you've selected. And what that does, let me uh, give it a value of, uh, let's say, 50 thousandths, and you'll see what I mean. Now look at this sideways comp center. Let's see what we get. If I look at it from the side here, the center of the tool is on the part. I don't want that. I want that to be left. Now my tool is off to the left. And look what happens. Now the tool is off to the left hand side of the part. If I play that, I get this. And I can scrub through here. Let's look at it from the side. So my tool is, the edge of the tool is violating the model slightly by a quarter millimeter. Okay, I got a uh, message. What if the edge was already chamfered on the 3D model? I can show you. Great question, guys. So let's play that. And there we go. So let me close that. And uh, let me jump over to put a modeled chamfer. So I'll come back to the design workspace. That's a great thing about Fusion. I'll come to chamfer. That's here under modify. Chamfer. I can grab this top face, and on the size, let's give it a nice small chamfer, quarter millimeter. I don't want to make it too big, just nice corner break. So now that's modeled in there. Okay, we'll come back to manufacture. These are red because the model 
that I've created, there's been some changes and I need to right mouse click and regenerate. Fusion will go through and regenerate. And there's some areas here that are broken. What are those? See that red error? Basically, contour selection is missing because that edge, remember when I contoured that, I clicked on that bottom edge. Well, by creating that chamfer, I deleted that edge and I created two new edges. So what I'd need to do is come back into here. I right mouse click to edit. It says, hey, Angelo, this operation has missing references. Do you want to clear? I'm going to say no and I recommend saying no so that when you come into here, you can see this and it says that that chain is missing. See, it's dashed red. So I'm going to deselect that and I'm going to come into here and say, now grab that edge. And that's, um, whoops, remember my bottom reference? <laughs> it also is losing that. Remember it said I'm missing two references. So I need to reselect that bottom there. Now I want to go below that by a certain amount. Hit OK. That's fixed. This trace is the first one I did, uh, but this is one here at the bottom that we just did live and blew up. So how do we fix that? Right mouse click, edit. It says, hey, Angelo, you have missing references. I'm going to say no, do not clear them because it says that's dash red. So I can immediately see, oh, that's dashed red. I'll deselect it and I'm going to grab uh, this edge here. I want to grab the lower edge come here to passes and I'm going to, because the, that edge, the tool will be controlled on that edge instead of where it was a little bit higher. I'm going to make this zero, leave the chamfer tip offset, leave that still at left and we'll get our tool path. And now if I play that and I'll pause, you'll see that the edge of the tool is right on the edge of that chamfer. Now you do get some weirdness depending on the angle of this slope. My good buddy, Tim Paul, or One Ear Tim on Instagram, he, um, super smart dude, he did a nice, uh, some tutorials about that based on the angle of this. You'll get some deviation on that. Um, super good stuff, super smart guy. So when you're going up and down in Z, it does its best job to create that chamfered toolpath. But that's a good use for trace. Another good use for trace. Uh, let's go in order here. Trace, thread, bore, circular engrave. Um, because we got this part open, I'm going to jump down to the engrave portion really quick. Now under engrave, we have some options here. If I just come here to engrave, and uh, let me back up really quick. Pay attention to this. It says, in that tooltip, machines along contours with V-shaped chamfered walls, like a V-carve style engraving. So uh, under my geometry, I'm going to grab these letters. Under passes, you've got some options here, but I'm just going to leave it as is. And what you'll get, the tool will down enter into that and it will like ramp down where the corners are and give you a V-carve style. So if I simulate, Boy, we are quickly running out of time. <laughs> time certainly flies. So now the tool is entering down there. Now, one, one thing, check it out. When I look at this tool path, you see those yellow rapid moves? It's re coming here, rapiding down, feeding down, engraving, rapiding all the way up and moving over. Uh, how do you control that? With the Heights tab. Pay attention when you come to the Heights tab to like this, that's kind of brown on my screen and orange. Um, pay attention to your heights. So on the feed height here, I can do uh, selected contour, change this value a little bit. Uh, you can even delete that and I say disable that. Um, retract height, instead of going to the stock top, let's say selected contour and only go uh, 0.1 above that. And let's see what happens when I hit OK. It's still, because there's still one other one I need to address. Uh, feed height. So this one here, retract height. Uh, let me change this thing to selected contour and see what we get. Still high. Why is it doing that? 
what I should have done is here, top height is selection. So watch this, I can come here to selection. And then when I grab that, make this guy uh, minus 0 0.01. And then let's see what happens. Still up. There's one I'm missing, and that is going to be like these guys up here. So this one is from top height, and this one uh, retract height. And you see that's at 400, let's do 0.1, and this one 0 0.020. So now that, see that orange there? It's a lot lower. Okay. So there we go. Um, that's how you control that. So it's not lifting and retracting. That will give you a V-car style. But what if you wanted to do a single stroke font like that? Like um, just do a quick single stroke engrave, save time instead of doing this. Um, what you do is trace. Come here to trace. I'm gonna use that same tool under geometry. Grab that letter there. And I'm going to leave it all as default, except uh, axial offset minus 0 0.01 inches, about a quarter millimeter. Now that'll be the single stroke. It'll feed down in. And again, you can play with those heights to keep that down. So that's how you would handle single stroke fonts. Where are we at now? Uh, we need to now do some... We covered all of these up to trace. We needed an engrave. We need to do thread bore, circular, and chamfer. Coming up six minutes to the top of the hour. Let's see if there's anything else. Nope, we're good. No comments from Mr. Brad. Thanks, Brad, for answering the chat. Appreciate it. Okay, we need to cover, and uh, I'm gonna come to this part here. And let me switch screen. Where's my part? So this part on my screen that I'll be showing now is an actual part I designed in Fusion and machined it on a Haas UMC 500. Did it at the SEMA show last year, and it was at a few Haas events. Uh, we're also going to talk about the threading that I created. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, come on. Now it's not good. There we go. So that's a thread. Uh, pipe thread fitting, uh, and then you can see there's some chamfers on there and some threads. So I'm gonna show you how I did those in Fusion. Switch my screen. So I typically, when I do my designs, I do not model the threads. It's not necessary, not necessary, uh, but I do want to model the, uh, so in this case, it was an NPT uh, thread, pipe thread, and I modeled the chamfer and I modeled that tapered hole. That is tapered, drafted. Okay, so if I come over here, look at this. I actually used a bullnose end mill to chamfer that, and then the next toolpath below. I obviously, I pre-drilled these, obviously, and then I came to here, chamfered it, and then I bored all the way down to the bottom with an end mill. How did I do that? So I came under here, under 2D, so I used the bore. So bore works for internal holes or cylindrical bosses. And they could be straight walled or drafted or tapered walls. So in this case, that was a tapered wall. And I'm gonna pick my tool. And if I go to that setup that I'm working in, that was op two. And it was, um, where's my quarter inch? Where's my quarter inch bull? There, there it is right there. I hit select, I grab that tool under geometry. Remember we talked earlier about tool orientation. Initiate that. So I can just grab a face of a cylinder. Um, I can grab this cone, which will give me that face. I can grab that line if I know that line's in line with that, but I'm just gonna grab this cylinder there and on circular face selection. I'm just gonna grab that face. And it automatically gives me a tool path. I could grab that one too, but I'm gonna show you in just two separate steps. Grab this one here. Under heights, I'm gonna leave it how it is. It's already going to the bottom of that 
hole that I selected under passes. The pitch, this is uh, how deep it goes per revolution. Now this bore command is a like a spiral helix is in. So I'm gonna give that something nice and small. So it gives me a nice surface finish. And that part I had in my hand, this is exactly how I did it. So now I can hit okay. And let's do that bore down in there as well. Actually, um, yeah, let's do the same thing. Instead of circular, let's do bore. And again, I'm gonna change my tool orientation to this. And then my selection of that hole is this guy and change the step down to some value, nice and small. You can do those all in one, but I just want to show you again the workflow for that. So now let me grab both of those and right mouse click, hit simulate. Give that a second to load. I'm leaving my stock off just so you can see. And it's gonna spiral down and generate that chamfer. You'll be surprised how good this turns out. Turns out really good, really, really good. So to save time, I'm gonna cancel that because we got a few more to go. Again, I got that part in my hand and uh, worked out really well. Okay, so we talked about bore. Circular is identical. The only difference between the two is instead of spiraling down, so we're gonna leave it normal orientation. I'm just gonna grab this. What it will do is it'll come down to a certain depth, interpolate, come back out, go to the next depth. Uh, so the only difference is the step down. Uh, I'll leave it at 40 thou. It's about one millimeter. The only difference is um, it's not helixing down. It's doing the same depth each time. So it's coming down to Z depth, milling around it, and then taking the next depth. When you're doing a bore like this, you can have it. You see where it's starting? It's not on center. If you hit this checkbox, you can have it start on center. Works really good if you pre-drilled that hole. I'm going to hit OK, and there's our circular. Works good. Another thing on here, uh, we talked um, a little bit about wear comp. You can turn it on right here. Thanks to my buddy Morgan for reminding me to talk about that. All right, next up, what do we have? Circular engraved, we talked about that. Next is 2D chamfer. We're at the top of the hour, a few more minutes. Finally, I've got this part. This is a good example how we can showcase some of the uh, chamfering strategies. 2D chamfer. Coming over here, we'll do 2D chamfer. Keep in mind that you can chamfer in 2D contour. And if you have a, uh, remember we did the trace with the modeled chamfer. So if you have a part that has modeled chamfers, you could use this and under passes, you can initiate it right here exactly how I showed you in that trace command. Works really good, but I'm not doing a 2D contour for this. I am gonna utilize the uh, 2D chamfer operation. I'm gonna use that same tool under geometry. I'm just gonna keep it simple. I'm just gonna grab, uh, let's grab this top edge and it's gonna chain everything. I can go ahead and pick everything on the whole part. I can even pick uh, edges that are in a different Z depth or different Z. Again, I'm not gonna go through everything. I will show you how to handle that when you get into bore like this. Um, under passes, let's give it some specifications. I'm gonna tell it 10,000 chamfer and 40 thousandths on my tip offset. I'm gonna give this a big number on purpose. Let's go, what if we do that, 0.1. And then, so look at this tool tip. That is how deep the tool is going from the tip of the tool. And that will control some behavior. You'll see it in a moment. Chamfer clearance. See that shank or shaft clearance to the vertical wall of that uh, model there? You can control that. If you're bold and you know everything's right, you can give it a smaller number. So the heights tab, I always leave that as selected contours. Hit OK. Now we've got some things here happening. You'll see that my tool is gonna hit this guy, so I'll hit this 
step here, it'll come over here. It automatically does where it's starting and ending based on your settings. And then remember I selected this whole top edge, but it didn't uh, come across here because the tip of the tool would violate this because the distance from the top of this face to the top of the part is less than that. Remember that tool uh, tip value I gave it? So it's only gonna be able to enter in here. So let me play that quickly. I don't have stock on, but watch, you'll see the behavior. You'll see it when it gets into this corner. Yep, see it lifts up because it can't go in there because the tip of the tool would gouge into that top surface. So that's what that tip offset is for. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cancel that, or sorry, close that out. I'm gonna right mouse click, edit, almost done guys. Uh, sorry, under passes, instead of going uh, 100 thousandths deep, I'm gonna say uh, 50, whoops. So 0 0.05, and now when I hit okay, you'll see the tool tip will just clear that, and if I simulate, play that guy. Uh, we're coming at the top. We're actually at the top of the hour. I wonder what everyone's saying. Go over, go over. Oh, I missed a thread. How did I miss that? You're right. I'll come back to that. Sorry, Stuart. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. <laughs> go over, go over. All right, I'll go over. So let me start this at the beginning. Hit play. And now you'll see that this will mill over the top. The tooltip is not going to gouge. And it works great. So very important to pay attention to your settings. All right. So now we're getting that. But when you go deeper with the tool, then uh, you have a different behavior on where it's entering and exiting because that shaft or shank has to avoid. Okay. <clears throat> One more thing on chamfer that I want to talk about is how do you handle if you're in an area like this. So let me come into here. I'll do 2D chamfer. I'll just pick this circle. I'm not gonna change it into my settings. Uh, let me just look here briefly and see what I have. So it says 40 thou chamfer width, 40 thou tip offset. If I hit okay, look what it did. I told it to mill that full circle, but Fusion says, hey, Angelo, you can only machine that area. You'll see it if I simulate. If I hit play, it's only doing that area. Why? Because of the settings I gave it and this distance from this uh, shank, some people call it shaft, to that wall. How do you control that? So what you wanna do is get the tool deeper. So if you bring the tool deeper, this edge will move over left a little bit more, which will give us more clearance. So. I'm gonna right mouse click, I'm going to edit. This is where it gets good. So under my tip offset, I know that uh, this number is half my tool. I can go in there and give formulas, like whatever my tool is, but let's do something like this. 150. And I just want a small quarter millimeter or 10 thou corner break. And this clearance, remember from the wall, of the model to the shank of the tool. Let's make that small as well and see what we get. Now I got a full chamfer based on my settings. So be mindful of that guys, you have a lot of control. So if I pause that, you can see plenty of clearance here. But if my tip was higher, by moving that tip higher, the shank gets closer to this wall. So that's how you control that, finish that. Okay, we missed a thread, and on that part I had in my hand, I thread milled that guy. Okay, let's come back to that oil filter housing part. And maybe I'll do a giveaway and give that part away. All right, so you can see here, uh, I did a thread mill. I did one there and there using tool orientation. So it's tool number eight. So how did I do that? Um, right here, yeah, I totally skipped that. All right, thread. Look for tool number eight in this uh, oil filter housing setup. Number two, there it is. There's my thread mill. 
I'll hit select. And uh, remember I talked about tool orientation. I want to inline with that cylinder. And what am I thread milling? This, there, the heights I'll leave, passes. There's my pitch. Keep in mind, um, we've got a pitch diameter offset. So if you read that in the bold, uh, almost at the bottom, I'm not quite. The difference between the major diameter and the minor values. This is the thread depth, the thread, uh, how much the thread is violating into that cylinder, and it's a positive value. So you have to do some math based on the pitch and thread size to do that. Um, I'm not going to spend time on that today. It's not a machining uh, lesson. Ah, look what happened. It's starting on the wrong side. Why? Can anybody tell me why? I need to flip the Z. I didn't pay attention to that. So the Z is pointing that way based on the cylinder, cylinder I selected. So I flip the orientation. Now it's okay. Again, I'm not going to worry about that thread engagement. I have that number um, here. I gave it a value of 0, 7, 3. So I think that's all of the toolpaths. Uh, I could have gone a lot more, like maybe a two-hour session, uh, because there is just so much. Uh, that we can cover on these, but one hour goes quickly when we're having fun. I'm going to take a look to see if Brad sent me a message on my phone. No, we are good. No messages there. Let me do those announcements again really quick. Uh, Brad, thank you for everything. Yep, thanks, Brad, for sending me that. All good. Uh, thank you for everything. Uh, everybody else, um, our next live stream is January 7th. It's going to be Brad doing uh, How Would You Make That? Uh, make sure to uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, our last day is tomorrow, and we're off for a few weeks to enjoy the holiday with our families. So uh, with that, I uh, wish you all a happy holiday season, and uh, it's been a good year, and let's make uh, next year better. And again, Brad, thanks for everything you do. Uh, you are a rock star and my hero. So, all right, guys, everybody, it's been a wonderful year. Uh, be safe. Take care. Bye.